Hi, Mark Grant here with a three-step trauma-informed process for overcoming chronic pain or medically unexplained symptoms. And here it is. One, understanding pain. Two, repairing your mind-body connection. And three, brain retraining. Now, I created this video because most other pain videos out there have one or two of these elements, but not all three. And as you're about to learn, you need all three. The famous Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran once said, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. Like any problem in life, understanding chronic, unexplained pain is the key to overcoming it. In this video, I'm going to explain the hidden psychological causes of chronic pain, namely chronic severe stress and attachment problems. And in a second video, how to use this knowledge to overcoming pain. Now, I'm coming at this problem from the perspective of a trauma-informed psychologist. So you will get different information in this video than you might get from a physical therapist or a medical professional. However, I will be trying to draw together a lot of information from these different disciplines into my account of chronic pain. So there's a couple of things I want you to bear in mind as we go forward. Number one is that chronic pain is a complex problem with many causes genetics, injury and disease, inflammation, psychological trauma, dissociation, central sensitization, even culture. Number two, that although we experience pain as a bodily sensation, it is produced by your brain. Without a brain, you couldn't feel pain. And without a brain, you couldn't change pain. And your brain responds to the world in two basic ways, pain or pleasure. You've probably heard of the fight, flight or sympathetic response and the rest and relax or parasympathetic systems, which is also part of your brain's reward system. There's a third set of responses that kick in if your brain experiences too much stress for too long, when your whole nervous system just kind of shuts down due to exhaustion. That's called dorsal vagal shutdown. So just going through these now, your brain's reward system, also known as the mesolimbic system, consists of the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. And it relies on various neurotransmitters, chiefly dopamine, which is kind of a pleasure and satisfaction neurotransmitter, GABA, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, and oxytocin, also known as the love hormone, which gets triggered when we feel close to somebody or attracted to somebody. So these feel-good chemicals are stimulated by pleasurable activities, such as eating, exercise, exercise, sunlight, social connection, and sex. Basically, when your brain's reward system is active or at least accessible, you're feeling good and you're in no pain. The exception is people who use pain to block negative emotions. They're deliberately inducing physical pain to numb emotional stress. The brain's danger system or fight-flight response consists of the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and the adrenal glands. It relies on different neurotransmitters to your reward system, as you can imagine, chiefly adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol. These neurotransmitters can actually block pain in the early stages of injury, but because the body is not designed to be in a permanent state of arousal, they eventually lead to a state of exhaustion or dorsal vagal shutdown, which involves increased sensitivity to pain. The danger system, fight-flight response, or HPA axis gets activated by any significant physical or emotional threat. For example, physical or sexual abuse in childhood or emotional abuse or adult trauma such as assault, rape, accidents, medical trauma, all manner of events. And the fight-flight system of course involves increased heart rate and respiration and if the circumstances are sufficiently threatening can lead to long-term tension, anxiety and intrusive thoughts and memories, i.e. post-traumatic stress disorder. If the trauma occurred in childhood however, the symptoms of PTSD tend to become less acute over time so that by the time the individual is an adult, they're more likely to suffer from chronic tension, anxiety, fatigue, identity confusion, and interpersonal difficulties rather than the overt nightmares and flashbacks that we associate with PTSD. Ideally, your brain is designed to operate in a kind of balance, seeking rewarding stimuli, resting and relaxing, and occasionally entering a fight-flight state. In that state, in that balanced state, you should only feel pain when you're sick or injured. Overactivation of a fight flight response through stress and trauma, including a lack of secure attachment in childhood, tilts the nervous system in the direction of pain. And because it happens when you're so young, either you don't remember it or you have developed coping strategies to reduce its importance. Another circumstance which can predispose a person to chronic pain is attachment problems in childhood. Attachment refers to the loving bond between a child and its parents, particularly the mother. It involves attuned verbal, emotional, and nonverbal communication between mother and infant. After food, 
food and water having a secure attachment is vital for the normal development of the human nervous system mentally and physically. Attachment problems in childhood have been linked to a host of adult health problems including fibromyalgia, coronary heart disease, increased risk of accident and injury, cancer and chronic pain, as well as anxiety and depression. Most folk are unaware of this because the problem started when they were too young to be conscious of the changes that were happening in the nervous system and they developed coping mechanisms like denying they were vulnerable or hurt as a way of surviving. In psychology we call this dissociation because the denial happened unconsciously outside of awareness. So getting back to how attachment problems and early childhood trauma lead to chronic pain and medically unexplained symptoms. I mentioned earlier how your brain reacts to positive and negative stimuli via the reward and a fight-flight system. You're actually born with the reward system, but not a fight-flight system. It takes about three months to develop. So beginning with the reward system, it actually has two key elements. Novelty seeking, which is mediated by the ventral striatal pathway. If you're a neuroscientist, you'll be interested to know that. And the familiarity system, which is mediated by the dorsal striatal pathway. And you're also born with an active novelty seeking system, but not familiarity system. As you become familiar with your mother or attachment figure, the familiarity side of the reward system develops. It can take a, uh, a few months. And the emphasis of the nervous system functioning shifts from novelty seeking to seeking familiarity. But if the infant is subject to trauma or emotional neglect, problems arise. There are actually three things that happen. Firstly, the reward system for social connection doesn't develop. The infant fails to develop a preference for familiarity that is necessary and part of attachment bonding. Instead, the novelty system remains dominant. As an adult, that individual will be drawn to novel stimuli such as drugs, sex, workaholism, all kinds of activity. In fact, engagement in externally rewarding activities becomes the only way such individuals individuals can regulate their emotions. Thirdly, once it comes online, after about two or three months or so, the fight-flight response or HPA axis remains chronically activated to compensate for the lack of safety that absent or insecure attachment represents. And by the way, before you were even born, you were being influenced by what's happening in your mother's nervous system. If your mother was a trauma or abuse survivor, her oxytocin levels will be lower, which means that the infants will also be lower. Remember, oxytocin is the love bonding chemical, and oxytocin is important in helping you cope with stress. Higher levels of oxytocin are responsible for decreased response to acute stress, i.e. Uh, lowered cortisol levels. The second thing that happens as a result of childhood trauma is that the individual grows up with some level of dissociation or disconnection between their mind and body. And this shows up as difficulty recognizing and expressing feelings of vulnerability, recurring feelings of numbness or detachment from yourself or others, problems with intimacy kind of division of the identity or self into parts. For example, a false self that acts strong and invincible, which is hiding authentic and normal needs for intimacy and vulnerability. Addiction, as I mentioned earlier, and unexplained physical symptoms. And the net effect of dissociation is that you are living at odds with your physical and emotional needs, leading to a chronic mismatch between what you need and how you behave, all of which puts undue stress on your nervous system. The third effect of chronic stress, trauma, attachment problems in childhood is that the HPA axis, the fight-flight response, gets chronically activated. The individual is in a constant state of alertness and you know, kind of danger perception. Overactivation of the HPA axis leads to too much cortisol. Again, while elevated levels of cortisol have pain-numbing effects in the short term, they ultimately lead to exhaustion and increased sensitivity to pain. For example, increased cortisol causes decreased immune functioning, leading to increased inflammation. Too much cortisol is also neurotoxic. It inhibits neural connections, which can cause problems with memory and learning. Chronic stress can also increase your vulnerability to things like the common cold and cold sores through lowered levels of lymphocytes white blood cells that fight off infection. So that's how stress primes your brain and your body for pain. This is not a new idea either. As pain expert Ronald Melzack said over 20 years ago, stresses have destructive effects on muscle, skeletal, and neural tissue, which may become the immediate basis of pain or provide a basis for the devastating effects of later mild injuries in which the severity of pain is disproportionately far greater than will be expected from the injury. So the takeaway is that 
while whatever injury or illness initially triggered your pain may still be present and contributing something to the level of discomfort that you're experiencing, the fact is that the greater the passage of time, the more likely it is that psychobiological neurological factors playing a greater role in the maintenance of your pain and discomfort. So at the start, I quoted Khalil Gibran, your pain is the breaking of the shell which encloses your understanding. The other half of that quote is, it is the bitter potion by which the physician within you heals your sick self. So who is the physician within you and what is the bitter potion? The physician within you is your wise self, the part of you that is able to face the bitter pill that is the truth behind your pain, the truth you couldn't bear to face because you were too young, vulnerable, or just outgunned. It could be some life-threatening event or circumstances from which you escaped physically, but not emotionally, or maybe are still in the midst of. But certainly, it involves the possibility that your mother or father rejected, abused, or neglected you. This is a very hard truth to accept. And let me remind you that the research says that 75% of chronic pain sufferers have uh, some sort of attachment problem with their parents, meaning they did not experience the secure love and bonding that is necessary for physical and emotional development. Even in healthy people, the percentage of attachment problems is surprisingly high at around 50%. There are many reasons why parents seem to fail so badly, and I don't mean to sound like a parent basher, it's the toughest job in the world, but many parents parents have their own trauma that they're coping with, or maybe they were survivors of uh, some sort of war or uh, political adversity. Perhaps they're migrants struggling to survive in a new country or products of a culture that discouraged emotional expression. Regardless, as you've learned, pain is the end result of your attempts to cope with some absence of emotional security when you most needed it. So the number one thing you have to do is overcome your pain is to develop a connection between your mental and physical self. Without this, even the most determined application of pain management strategies will fail. No matter how much meditation, physical therapy, or even brain retraining you do, it will fail unless it's accompanied by a reconnection between your mental and physical selves. In the following video, I'm going to show you a two-step process for maximizing a bunch of pain healing strategies by preceding them with a self-connection process, a journey if you like.